don't put all of your eggs into one basket. That's a phrase that we've probably all heard at one point or another in our lives. And I would guess that we have a general idea of what it means. Perhaps one of the most frequent applications of this maxim is associated with money and investing. Investing 101 teaches us that the ideal approach to investing for most people is built on the idea of a diversified portfolio, a collection of assets with different traits and characteristics, assets that sometimes have opposing behaviors. Simply stated, an approach that generates strong benefits from a collection of differences. Well, why is this generally considered to be an ideal approach to investing? It's because the diverse attributes of these assets when working together typically create, typically create the highest return with the lowest risk. Well, what if we thought about our relationships, our experiences, or our communities in the same way we did that investment portfolio? What if we work together in ways that our different ideas, strengths, and even weaknesses brought greater benefits to more people? How much higher rewards might we achieve? How much richer might our lives and our communities be? But when it comes to the topic of diversity, people often get anxious, they get angry, and sometimes we just all feel fatigued. But does it really need to be that way? In 2005, with absolutely zero political experience, I decided to run for mayor of my hometown of Youngstown, Ohio. There were a lot of seasoned experts who advised me to, in effect, put my eggs in one basket. They said, Jay, you have to focus on people who look like you, who think like you, and have the same lived experiences, people who will agree with your approach. Don't waste your time in the parts of the city that for the past 155 years have never supported a black mayoral candidate. While I understood the importance of, of building a base, the notion of ignoring or rejecting the other parts of the city because they might not agree with me just didn't sit well with me. I understood that you could not be an effective leader if you were only interested in engaging those who agreed with you. So I set about walking my city. I found myself in the familiar neighborhoods in which I was raised, but I also found myself in parts of town that I had only been driven through as a kid during Christmas time to see the big houses and the fancy lights. Some of those neighborhoods felt foreign and uncomfortable to me. As I stood on the porches making the case to be mayor, I felt sense of fear and trepidation in a place that I had lived for more than 30 years. There were people who made eye contact, looked through the window, and closed the blinds. They made it clear they didn't want to hear anything that I had to say, and those were the people being polite. There were others who, in very explicit and derogatory terms, told me I wasn't welcome, they didn't want to see me in their neighborhood, on their porch, and I could take my message and move on. And as unsettling as those experiences were, I was also inspired by people who invited me to sit down to a, a glass of lemonade in the heat of an August campaign or for fresh-baked cookies. And I was particularly inspired by a 14-year-old kid named Jack, a redhead, freckle-faced kid who loved his city. Some even called Jack the mayor of his neighborhood. Jack just showed up one day, and he told me that he was going to take me around his hood and that we were going to leave our mark on territory that was politically defined as out of my reach. See, these white neighborhoods typically supported white candidates. And my opponent was a well-known, long-time political figure who was widely assumed to continue the sweep of these neighborhoods on his way to near certain victory. So Jack and I, as kind of this odd couple, set off to shake things up. Jack took me on a journey in my own city in a way that I had never imagined, as I met his family, his friends, and his neighbors. On the last day of the campaign, I remember telling my wife that whether we won or lost, I was a better person because of the experience. I had seen my city of 30 years through a new and different lens. That lens wasn't always rosy, but it helped me see more clearly. 
the displeasure that I felt in being told I didn't belong in certain neighborhoods helped me to ultimately be comfortable being uncomfortable with needed change. That evening on the news, I remember it vividly. The prognosticators and the pundits said I didn't get it done. Jay failed to close the deal. They were predicting my margin of defeat, saying he wasted time, energy, and effort in parts of the city that would never support him. The headline of the paper the next day, City Picks Jay. I woke up as the first black mayor ever elected to the city of Youngstown, the youngest ever elected, and perhaps equally importantly, the first independent candidate to win in more than 80 years. And the race, thank you. And the race wasn't even close. Our strength and our success was in our diversity. And about a year after I took office, I had a visit from a campaign strategy team working for a then lesser-known senator from Illinois. And they wanted to know how this happened in a place like Youngstown, Ohio. And a few years after that, I found myself working in a White House for President Barack Obama. And about Jack. Jack now holds a master's degree in urban planning and is still working to make Youngstown, Ohio a better place to live, work, and play to this day. So during my time in Washington, I traveled to virtually every state in this country. I spent considerable time on the ground in struggling communities, communities that were different politically, they were different demographically, they were different culturally, but they were all struggling economically. And the narrative in the media had these communities as some sort of combatants in this twisted hunger games of economic survival, fighting for scraps the urban communities against the rural communities, the black and brown communities against the white communities, or what we continue to hear this day, the blue states versus the red states. Now, there were very real differences and very real struggles in these communities, but I found that there was something more powerful that actually united these communities in their differences, united them together. There was a common denominator. These communities were all going through pain, grief, anger, and frustration, but perhaps not in the way that you would imagine. See, the common denominator in all of these communities was the prosperity of the United States of America. The wealth that this country enjoys was forged in the steel mills of Youngstown, Ohio, and Gary, Indiana, and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The prosperity that we enjoy was excavated from the coal mines in Appalachia, whether it was Eastern Kentucky or West Virginia, the wealth and prosperity that this country enjoys to this day was grown in the agricultural heartland of Kansas and Wisconsin and Nebraska. But what was happening was that the contributions from those communities and the dignity and the pride of those contributions was being dismissed, devalued, and discarded as relics of the past. They were being seen as irrelevant. And to make matters worse, feckless and self-serving politicians realized that, and they began to turn the frustration of these communities against one another in an effort to deflect from their own failed leadership. They sold the lie to these communities that we're fighting for you, when in fact, the only thing they were fighting for was their own selfish interests and their rise to political power. It was happening then, and it's happening now. But this is where things begin to change. On the ground, these communities began to realize that there was more success and progress when they worked collaboratively, when they started demanding changes of their representatives in their state capitals and in Washington, D.C., of policies and approaches that would build economic prosperity for all, they demanded change. And as a matter of fact, I remember the progress that we were making. I was in Hazard, Kentucky, and we were sharing some of the progress that was happening on the ground in Youngstown, Ohio, and they bestowed an honor upon me that makes me proud to this day. They said, Jay, for the work that we've done together, we would like to name you an honorary Duke of Hazard. <laughs> I thought a black guy from Youngstown being named an honorary Duke of Hazard, I'll take it. 
And in that moment, I guess that made me the black Bo Duke of Hazard. <laughs> so after the time traveling the country and working in these communities, my family and I find ourselves moving here to the nutmeg state. As we moved to Connecticut, I remember someone saying, one of the most important things to remember about Connecticut is the number 169. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. Because that's the number of towns and communities that we have in our small but mighty state, a state that you can drive across in less than three hours. In the five and a half years that we've been here, I still, to this day, hear people talking about traveling to places in Connecticut as if you need a passport. <laughs> ask someone to attend an event and cross the Connecticut River, you might as well ask them to swim the English Channel or navigate some time-space continuum. <laughs> Every town in Connecticut and in the states wherever you live has something to add to the diversity and the richness of living there. If a passport were needed to travel your state, how many town stamps would your passport have? Four or five? Would anyone have 30? We should be intrigued by the prospect of broadening our horizons by engaging with communities that might just be a few miles away. I have the privilege to serve as the president and CEO of a large community foundation here in the state of Connecticut. Amongst other things, we provide grants to nonprofits to strengthen the community. We serve as a community convener and generally work to be a dynamic source for good across our region. The 29 towns that we serve are as diverse as you will find anywhere else in this country. The challenges and the opportunities they face are immense. But just like we did in that mayoral campaign, my foundation colleagues and I went to the front porches of each of these communities. We went to listen. We went to introduce our, reintroduce ourselves as a resource, as a collaborative, cross-cultural, cross-that-river community catalyst. And we understood and embraced the individuality of these communities, but we also recognized that if we didn't find a way to work through some of the barriers, to dismantle some of the structures, to address some of the inequities, we would never fulfill our role as a community foundation. So one of the things that we did was introduce our Greater Together Community Funds. And the idea is a pool of resources that are overseen by a diverse group of residents in those communities. The only caveat is that those communities have to have a diverse committee and they have to agree which projects or ideas they want to use their funds to support. And we added a little bit of a sweetener. For those communities that were willing to work and collaborate outside of their borders, we offered an even greater investment. Our communities here in Connecticut and across this country, our portfolios of talents, assets, lived experiences, ideas, just like that investment portfolio, we will achieve the highest degree of return and benefit in our communities when we work through our diversity, when we commit ourselves to equitable outcomes and opportunities, when we are serious about inclusivity. We exponentially increase our opportunities for success. You don't have to surrender your morals, your values, your beliefs to work successfully with someone who is different than you are. You can compromise your position on something without compromising your principles. So how about this? Check your state passport. Find a community that is as different from yours than you can imagine and commit to visiting a few points of interest. Or find a small business, a proprietor of a different gender, orientation, or background, and agree and commit to patronize that small business for the next three months. Or a neighbor, a coworker, whom you rarely have ever engaged. Spend an intentional half hour just talking to them about their lived experience on the job or in the committee, community. Embracing diversity, equity, and inclusivity, it isn't easy. It can cause tension, but tension in our everyday lives can do some marvelous things. That iconic bridge that you see that connects people in places it's driven over by hundreds of thousands of people every day, and it derives its strength through its tension. A sailboat can only reach its destination as a result of wind pushing against the sail, creating tension in our muscles. They can only grow stronger 
if we elect to put them under the appropriate amount of tension. A group of NASA scientists recently published a paper that talks about humanity's future in the universe. And amongst the conclusions that they reach were that the advancements, the greatest advancements in our society have come through a result of collaboration. But they also warn us that the greatest threat to those advancements are things like racism, inequity, and sabotage, things that are the antithesis of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I get it, not everyone's gonna buy into the compelling benefits of diversity and equity and inclusion, but if you are serious about making your community and by extension our society a better place to live, then what are you waiting for? It reminds me of a quote from the writer James Baldwin who admonishes us that not everything that we face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Thank you.